Hello, we're rolling into another episode of the DRH show. As usual, I talk to interesting people within psychology, mental health, and well-being. My brilliant guest for today is an expert in psychoanalysis. He's the head of psychosocial and psychoanalytic studies at the University of Essex. Dr. Chris Nicholson, thanks for joining me. Nice to be here. Okay. Um, Dr. Chris Nicholson, I suppose um, let's start off with you telling us your background, your trajectory in life, if you could share it, and how you ended up doing what you're doing. Okay. Well, it, it is, you know, it's a, it's a story in, in that I, I didn't ever intend to be working in a university. It was not on the cards at all. In fact, I think my, my mother <clears throat> said that I was the least likely in our family to, to succeed and do anything of, worthwhile. Um, and I grew up in, uh, in Tunbridge Wells in, in Kent, a very nice place, the gar Garden of England, they say. Um, and, uh, you know, it's a very beautiful sort of area. But I grew up in, in quite a, a tough little village outside of the main town of Tunbridge Wells, you know, which is sort of known for sort of retired brigadiers would go to Tunbridge Wells and people would, would uh, you know, make complaints from Tunbridge Wells. It's sort of famous for that sort of uh, energy. But... <clears throat> Where I came from was quite a, a rough sort of area, lots of uh, drugs, lots of crime, uh, not a lot of what you might call helpful provision. Uh, what has since been called, is in the 1970s, social capital. There wasn't a lot of social capital going on there, not much investment in that community. Mm -hmm. So it was uh, quite a tricky area to grow up in, really. And... Uh, while I was growing up there, my, my mother, who was a bit of a force to be reckoned with, you know, was, was taking us children, um, quite unusually actually for the area that I grew up in. Um, children were, were doing horse riding and learning to play the piano and uh, entering reading competitions and things like that. <clears throat> but unfortunately, my, my mother died uh, when I was about eight and I didn't have the joy of learning the piano or, or doing the horse riding and, and all the different things that she was doing. Um, and uh, there wasn't a lot of education in the family. There wasn't a lot of attention to learning. So I sort of got through, here's a visitor, <laughs> I sort of got through my um, early years, um, and I think I was quite preoccupied with, with, with the loss of my, my mother as a, as, a, as, a, as a young lad, and not really focusing and concentrating on, on school and education. But sometimes I picked up a book that had a particular interest and I, I found myself driven to, to, to read it. Um, and sometimes they were quite curious. I, I read a, 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 you know, an, an old English version of Robin Hood with Z's and Vows, um, whereas I, I wasn't reading what I was being asked to read at, at school in, in general. So it was a very interesting sort of... Uh, time and I, and I sort of survived school there was uh, you know it was quite a lot of bullying and and uh, violence sort of activity in, in that area um, and later on we moved into Tunbridge Wells town and that was uh, had a little bit more going on and, and a bit more of a social life and that, that was interesting and, and uh, good but I I moved around for a few years as a young lad you know 16 17 and I I traveled abroad I went to Europe and uh, while I was traveling I began to read and I was traveling on my own, so I had that sort of solitary sort of element. And uh, I started reading books by a guy called Anthony Storr, who's a psychiatrist, uh, psychotherapist, and a bit of a Jungian as well, um, <clears throat> who wrote some nice introductions to Freud and Jung. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really love the way that he wrote. He extraordinarily lucid, if you've, if you've read his works. He wrote a lot about creativity. Uh, and um, the uh, the need for creativity and he wrote about in opposition to some of Freud's ideas actually um, that might suggest that we need relationships entirely to be uh, socially happy and healthy individuals mentally healthy individuals but he was saying that creativity uh, was a was a key way in which people could gain uh, elements of their of their internal contentment and, and uh, have a better mental health and and he was he was saying this in opposition to Freud and, and various other writers, uh, various other uh, psychologists and, and psychotherapists. But he was he was getting to the point that many creative individuals, musicians, poets, philosophers, had spent very solitary lives, and uh, and he felt that the relationship to the work was what was really important, and that that capacity, that creativity, was a form of relationality, but it was indirect. Mm -hmm. through the through the medium of whatever their particular 
artistic endeavor was. So this impressed me hugely. And then, uh, you know, as I traveled through Greece, I, I read the Iliad, um, probably didn't understand all of it, but I, I was reading that while I was traveling in Greece. And I, and I, I read Keats's poetry while I was in Rome. And so I was beginning to get involved in literature and reading and studying, but I hadn't had any real formal education and came out of, you know, school with very few qualifications. Gradually, this interest gave me the notion that I ought to be doing something which is of use. And that took me to uh, an access course in social sciences in, in Tunbridge. And, um, and at the end of the access course, uh, which was mainly sociology and psychology and a few other bits uh, thrown in. I had also taken a small course in in literature, and 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 it seemed that I, I my passion for literature was was enormous. And it was only a you know it was a tiny bit of this course. It wasn't the main thing, social sciences. So then I applied for universities on the basis of this access course, but I applied to study literature, mm -hmm. but I'd done social sciences. And out of all of the applications I put in. I received no from every single one of them, um, and this was heartrending because I, you know, so I was sort of uh, twenty, about twenty-two at this stage, you know, sort of a, a mature student, let's say, um, and uh, and I was really broken. But my English tutor said, if anybody should go to university, it should be you. So she was doing an MA with a guy called Keith Carabine at Kent University, um, who writes about Conrad, as it happens, and um, she sent him a couple of my essays on 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 poetry. Um, 20th century poetry and, and this sort of thing and um, he read them and asked me for an interview which I, I did with, with him and he gave me an unconditional uh, entry into Kent University which was wonderful um, because he said it's on the basis of what you've written not your application and um, this was lovely and and so I went there to study English literature and uh, and I, I absolutely adored it uh, I met some really interesting people, principally uh, a chap called Professor Michael Irwin, who was uh, teaching Victorian literature, and um, you know he was interested in Lewis Carroll and um, Dickens. He taught Dickens, he taught Shakespeare, um, but he also knew um, he had met uh, the poet Robert Graves, and I had started reading about Robert Graves. He was a, he was a very curious and odd, um, self-obstructive. Uh, writer, um, you know, um, uh, an anti-modernist when he, when he started writing, you know, coming out of Victorian literature, an anti-modernist, but um, was a, a brilliant, uh, brilliant poet and a brilliant writer, um, Greek myths and uh, I Claudius and all these sorts of things. And, and he had met him. So I, I began to really read and research uh, Robert Graves and then found myself speaking at a, a conference at Oxford as an undergraduate. Um, writing about Graves and his ideas about the irrational, which came up in his poetry. Um, and uh, I never really looked back. I, I became so fascinated by, by Graves, he became the topic of my PhD. And again, I, I never did an MA. I, I, I wasn't thinking of doing a, a PhD, but somebody who, who had been at the conference, uh, Patrick Quinn, Dr. Patrick Quinn, I think he's a professor now. Uh, he um, he nurtured my interest in, in Graves and said, why don't you come do a PhD? So I ended up doing a PhD on Robert Graves. In the meantime, this is Rufus here, he wants to join in the interview. In the meantime, I, uh, I was uh, needing to earn a living. And after my undergraduate degree, I went to um, work in children's homes. Mm -hmm. You know, um, <clears throat> going to do this uh, PhD was 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 wonderful but i was working in residential childcare settings uh to um to earn um, uh, a living and um and I, you know i didn't really know what that was going to be like to, to go and work with very very troubled children i'd seen an advert and it had some sort of instinctive appeal for me so i went to work at this uh this children's home it was in an ordinary um uh, town faversham in kent and uh, had four or five young people in it <laughs> and they were quite troubled, very, very violent, and very angry. And uh, into this environment I came, and it was, it was a 50-hour week, 12-hour shifts, and it was very challenging. And, um, <clears throat> and, I, and, I, and I, I didn't really have any training. They didn't really offer much training. They had a very well-paid psychiatrist who worked there who 
came to work in the most amazing suits. And he must have been charging them a fortune. <clears throat> but he didn't really offer too much insight, I have to say, into the actual issues that were taking place for the young people. And so what did I lean upon? I, I, I le leaned upon what I'd learned, which was literature. And I understood that when you read a novel, you're reading a biography. And I understood in a novel, you have a plot, which is the top element. You know, it's what happens, the trajectory over time, these events happen. Underneath that, there are metaphors, analogies, similes, all of this subterranean material taking place, you know. And if you're reading Charlotte Bronte, you know, there'll be banshees screaming in the night and storms raging. And you know that all this is secondary to the plot, but it's actually where the real action is taking place. That's what the novel is, is really trying to get across. So I began to apply this interest in, in literature to what was happening for the children. You know, you could see the life history, you could see what was happening day to day, but what did it mean? And for that, you had to start connecting the elements of their background and their history together. And I, I, I felt that was the only way to understand what was taking place. Having said that, I also read their case histories and their backgrounds. And that was another way in which, because of the, the interest in, in, in literature where you analyse text, you get very good, actually, at picking up the subtle indications about particular aspects and you connect elements that perhaps you wouldn't do if you'd not, never read, uh, never read literature and, and poetry. So I was sort of analysing, if you like, um, some, of these, uh, some of these background writings they're written by psychiatrists, by social workers, by teachers, all from with different perspectives, trying to say something about what was going on. And I, and I found that what, what's happening is quite often they would say the children had anger or they were, had criminal sort of intent, um, but they, they would talk about their history, but almost as though the history were incidental to the current issues the children had. They might have a diagnosis of one kind or another. They might be said to have ADHD a little bit later, actually, but uh, in my history, not so much then, but conduct is order, certainly. But without any real explanation about, about how their background and history and early life linked with their current behaviour. And it was as though they had caught a cold. You know, they had a cold. It wasn't something that was, was emerging from a whole deep history and, and experience. They just had this issue with anger and they were being asked to change that behaviour and social workers would put pressure on you to, to change the child. Stop that. That child is self-harming. We want you to reduce that self-harm. Not to understand what it meant for the child and why they were engaging in it and was it even perhaps a form of communication? Were they actually trying to communicate wordlessly through their behaviour? So these are the kind of things that are preoccupying me and I began to, to see that in the, in the behaviour of the, the children. Um, in this very volatile and explosive setting where actually you didn't have time, you didn't have much time, you had to react and respond in the moment to what was happening. You know, one of my first days at work, a child tried to jump out of a window and they'd cut their arm, they were bleeding, and they tried to jump out of an upstairs window. And, um, and I was trying to prevent them. And I, and I was thinking, you know, how, how did I get here? What, what is going on? So I had to use what resources I had to, to begin to make some understanding. So then that began to connect the interest in literature and the interest in, in these youngsters. And I'd never read a jot, apart from while I was studying for my PhD, I'd ne not really read a great deal about Freud. Uh, you know, when I was reading Anthony Store, Freud came up, but I hadn't really read psychoanalysis in that way. Mm -hmm. it, it's really interesting how your background in, in um, literature shaped your interest um, for, for psychoanalysis. But I suppose what, what I'd like to ask at this point is, um, this is a fairly broad but significant question. Um, what is psychoanalysis? Sure. Well, that's, a, that's a, the million dollar question because mm -hmm. psychoanalysis is, is, a, is a difficult subject and a mm -hmm. difficult topic. Um, like a lot of, uh, uh, um, you know, periods in history, something emerges from the whole fabric of that particular time. And it may be concentrated in the mind of one particular person. In this case, it would be Freud. But it had been bubbling away for some time. And you see a few years before Freud, you know, Stevens um, is writing Jekyll and Hyde. And this is to do with the divided mind. And so it's in the air at that period. 
Um, but um, Freud obviously develops it after 10 or so years of being a, a, a you know, a, a general practitioner and, and seeing patients, uh, patient after patient. He develops it as a, as a form of treatment. But in fact, he's primarily interested as he goes along with his engagement with pa patients in understanding um, the human mind. And therefore, he's, he's interested in developing theory. And the theory emerges, however, from this form of practice. So for Freud, the clinic becomes a laboratory. It's a, it's a site of uh, in investigation into the human psyche. And of course, you know, he, he coins the term psychoanalysis in 1886, I think. Um, and he's, he's getting at something here by, by using this particular term. The psyche is uh, going back to the, you know, to the Greeks and you're thinking about the soul and you're thinking about breath and spirit and so on and so forth. But he doesn't, he doesn't call it psychology. It's not an ology. And for me, that's very important because it's, it, it differentiates it to some extent from the sciences, you know, geology and biology and so on and so forth. He calls it analysis, which goes back to analysis. And analysis is a, is a sort of untying and unloosening. So you imagine a knot. And I would think here the knot is a subjective self and the unconscious mind. And Freud is unloosening this. It's not such a logical procedure. It's not a formal science in the way that uh, physics is, for example, that you can do particular forms of experimentation and investigation because Freud's object is not the external world. It is not just about the external behavior, what can be measured. It is also about what can be not measured. Uh, so, you know, people have argued about whether psychoanalysis is a, is a science or mm -hmm. not. Um, but I think psychoanalysis is really this attempt to understand the subjective self. Mm -hmm. I, d I do think that Freud approached it as a science because he was a scientist. You know, he had been a neuroanatomist. Mm -hmm. He had studied the human, human brain. He had, he'd, he'd had, you know, sitting at the Sulpetria, he had children's brains delivered, which he then sat about analysing. You know, he had looked at the the uh, vertebrae of animals, he'd studied nerves, he'd written papers on asphasia. He was a brilliant scientist and some neurologists even today, uh, when they're talking about particular um, processes such as long-term potentiation, which is to do with memory, say that Freud made quite remarkable discoveries about these processes years before they were fully understood uh, by, by later neurologists. So he was a brilliant scientist. And there are people today, such as Mark Soames, who's the, the uh, psychoanalyst who's also a neurologist. And he, he's trying to connect some of Freud's ideas now, you know, Freud's mm -hmm. psychoanalytic ideas with his earlier neuro neuro neurological ideas and bring Freud up to date a bit. But because he was emerging from that scientific background, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> he, he, that, 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 that approach does come into his thinking, it informs his thinking but not the procedure that he uses. And that's perhaps the difference. So psychoanalysis is, is this uh, attempt to investigate the, the subjective and, and, and what is not necessarily measurable through the usual uh, sciences, you know, the normal sort of hard scientists. Mm -hmm. um, you, you characterize um, your, your definition of psychoanalysis as something which is, you, you try to, you, you emphasize that the ology is quite of detached from um, psychoanalysis. So I, I suppose what I'd like to understand is that um, it, uh, viewing it from that framework, would it be safe to say that um, psychoanalysis is still relatively a science or is it more as you, you've kind of um, characterized to us, is the exploration of psychological well-being? Mm. I would say that psychoanalysis is a way of apprehending the world, mm -hmm. a way of apprehending human beings. It's a particular form of perception. It's a form of looking. It's a sort of attitude of mind. Mm -hmm. And to that extent, it is a treatment. You know, Freud did develop a treatment psychoanalysis, which has had a huge impact. It's moved into different forms of psychotherapy, but all kinds of other therapies. And, and even the therapies which are against psychoanalysis, such as CBT, are are emerging in a dialectic you know they're emerging in a dialogue with freud and 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 a reaction to freud and the fact that the, you know the talking cure emerges and it was a phrase uh, that one of freud's patients uh, you know developed you know there was a, it wasn't freud's uh, idea the talking cure but that that has had a huge effect so so that that is a practice 
psychoanalysis as a practice and, and emerging into psychotherapy. Um, but it, but I always see it, perhaps because my literature background is connected with the humanities. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we don't we don't read a poem and say that it doesn't have validity because it isn't scientific. Mm-hmm. You know, it, it has a depth and it tells us something about about life and it has mm-hmm. a degree of uh, a capacity to sort of talk about truths. But mm-hmm. whether we give those truths a capital T or a small t mm-hmm. is another matter. And our lives would be hugely, uh, you know, lacking in, in enrichment if we didn't read poetry and literature. Similarly, I think psychoanalysis goes way beyond the practice of psychoanalysis. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, there are scientific procedures of, of research which emerge from psychoanalysis and are very important. Um, Freud's uh, uh, concept about you know, the human ambivalence, the fact that the mind is, is, is many things, not, not just one thing, and that we are ambivalent, that we are conflicted, that we have disagreements with ourselves, of which we sometimes know, but many times we don't know, is a, is a really important discovery. And we can, we can then think about his idea of free association. And free association, which is not really literary in the way that we think of the word association, it's whatever falls into the mind. That procedure, which is born out of psychoanalysis, born out of the treatment, to allow, and again, something that Freud learned from his patients, so he was learning collaboratively with his patients. What was it? that his patients needed to do. They needed to know more about themselves. You know, it's a sort of Greek, uh, the Delphic sort of, you know, edict to, to know thyself. And, uh, you know, Freud allows them to discover this by not censoring what they want to say. They're allowed to explore in this, in this, this manner. When you apply this to research, then you have the idea that the researcher, the, the psychoanalyst in this case, but it could be some other researcher in the social sciences, for example, this uh, individual becomes much more aware of themselves operating to affect the person they're engaging with, their their subject in this case, and and using free association to help the subject to understand more about themselves, but also being aware of their own processes as a scientist, you know, because we know that scientists affect the nature of the subject that they engage with. This is all part of the the um, you know the, the disruption of science you know that we have to realize that they, we, they, a scientist doesn't on high uh, give a, give a, their views and opinions about things from experimentation but the things they choose to explore the way they choose to explore it the way in which they they may uh, unconsciously affect the the field of study is crucial and I think Freud gives rise to a new appreciation of the scientific method mm-hmm. and um, through this capacity to be much more aware of one's own complexity as a scientist, as, a, as an engager in science, um, there is a, a, you know, a, a turn in, in some of the sciences, and particularly in sociology, to a much more emotional awareness about how these processes affect the field of investigation. And is that awareness of complexity, would you say that's the overarching value of psychoanalysis? I suppose what I'm trying to ask is that um, some, some people who would be listening to us, they would ask us, so what's the, the, the purpose of psychoanalysis? What, what, what's um, its main um, use? Okay, the purpose of psychoanalysis, well, as a treatment, of course, it's to help people become much more aware of their own proclivities and difficulties. Mm-hmm. And that's, a, you know, as a form of treatment. Um, <clears throat> And uh, I think it, in that sense alone, it's been invaluable. Mm-hmm. But in terms of its broader uh, impact on, on society, um, you know, it's enormous. It, it helps us to understand our complexity. It helps us to understand our, uh, the nature of subjectivity. Mm-hmm. Um, it helps us to understand uh, irrational behavior in, 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 in a social context. And we're, we're undergoing now this uh, extraordinary period of time where we're all in this lockdown and um, <clears throat> and uh, you know we've seen irrational behavior writ large in the way that there was a, a an overriding denial in fact about the danger of the coronavirus uh, people were not able to recognize fully the threat that they were facing and went about their business in a, in a quite an irrational way 
And there was a group behavior that was involved in that, which is also a factor in the sort of, you know, unconscious social dynamics. Um, and then gradually people have began to appreciate the reality of this situation, but it's taken a long, long time. So the, the denial of the threat, the sense in which we are invulnerable, and you see this in, in our own prime minister, you know, he went about his business in a Herculean way, like some sort of God. Uh, there's a sort of degree of hubris in, involved in that. And of course, he's become ill and hopefully that would make him a better prime minister because he, he realizes he's not invulnerable. And I think this capacity to get in touch with, with the reality of the situation is, is, a, is a, it can be investigated and, and considered from a psychotic point of view. Mm -hmm. And um, another thing that I'd like to um, touch upon is you, you mentioned earlier about psychotherapy, but I think a lot of people, including myself, um, do not really understand the, the difference between psychoanalysis and psychotherapy. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, psychotherapy as a term now can mean many things and people can be psychotherapists without being psychoanalytic. Mm -hmm. You know, you have integrative psychotherapies and, and things like this. So, but in terms of the different things, psychoanalysis, Psychoanalysis, uh, in uh, you know, is is one of the first practices of a treatment where the idea was, apart from you know, the, the, you know, that one is offering a treatment, one has to be the recipient of that treatment also. So the fact that the psychoanalyst has psychoanalysis himself, uh, the idea is if you're going to uh, try to attempt to understand other people's selves, one needs to really desperately uh, and in great depth understand one's own self. Um, and so that that notion that you have psychoanalysis at a depth of perhaps up to five times a week and psychoanalysts have a long term training, which includes academic training of quite a considerable degree. They'll be writing papers and exploring the theory and, and, and writing, uh, you know, engaging in research to some depth. Whereas in psychotherapy training, that research, I think, has increasingly come in in that most psychotherapists now, even in the psychoanalytic and sort of Tavistock tradition, you know, they'll be introduced to research in, in broad terms, sort of sociological research and other forms of research, you know, interviews and so on and so forth. <clears throat> but they won't have the depth of the theory uh, and the intensity of the therapy that might come about in psychoanalysis. So there's a specific form of training for psycho psychoanalysis. In psychotherapy, it's a lot less. But also in psychotherapy, it's been that 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 uh, notion has been taken up in terms of the talking cure, and the trainings are very very variable. Some trainings will be uh, you know a couple of years and others will be six years. Mm -hmm. And so you can see the depth. And I think in psychoanalytic psychotherapy and psychoanalysis, the depth is much greater. The intensity of one's own analytical work uh, is much greater. Mm -hmm. And you know, they would be the, the uh, distinctions. Mm -hmm. um, but, but I suppose whether you're a psychoanalyst or a psychotherapist, um, I, I don't know if I'm right with this, but by and large, you're a follower of Freud. So if you could just... Um, um, tell us what did he get right and what did he get wrong. But first, um, um, whether you're a psychotherapist or, or a psychoanalyst, are you really largely a follower of Freud? Uh, I'm not a follower, really, of, of, of anyone. Uh, not even Robert Graves, he was my mm. PhD subject. Um, I, I think I, you know, I'm deeply interested in, in Freud. And I think the key thing about Freud is that we hear more, mostly about Freud mm -hmm. from secondary texts from commentary, from popular, uh, popular science, and maybe from popular culture. But what we don't often do is read Freud. And when you read Freud, you engage with, with this individual in a very different way, uh, because he was a remarkable writer, uh, deeply interested in literature. You know, he had read Shakespeare, he's constantly referring to Shakespeare, to Goethe, and, and other literary writers. Um, you know, Sophocles, of course, comes into his Oedipus complex, and he's he's drawing upon literature all the time. Um, and so you see here somebody who's deeply engaged in culture, very well um, read, um, very uh, interesting, and trying to innovate and explore, and actually incredibly self-critical. You see him changing his mind, because people often think about Freud from a sort of stereotypical point of view, you know, um, sex-obsessed. Uh, everything was about the, the you know uh, libidinal, libidinal wishes uh, and images, but but that's not quite so when you read Freud. And, and I have to say, my initial reading of Freud begins with studies in hysteria, which is before 
uh, several years before he, he comes to the interpretation of dreams. And studies in hysteria is a text which is relevant today and could be read by medical practitioners now. It's a brilliant work, um, really, and it, very, very engaging and, and, and very, it gives a lot to the reader. Um, and uh, so I think Freud, you know, you have to really read Freud and get into the depth of it. And when you read Freud, you realize that he's a brilliant mind working. And of course, he's working in a very different way. But that's what makes him valuable because he offers something new uh, in a particular perception. So I wouldn't say I'm a follower of Freud, but I have a, an, an enormous respect for his writings and for the, uh, the various uh, waves of uh, cultural uh, investigation, social investigation, psychological investigation that he set going uh, in a particular way. And, you know, and of course, along with uh, Marx and, and Darwin and others, you know, he brought about modernism and this, this new way of thinking, this disruptive way of thinking about the world, and he's applying it to ourselves. So we know that we can disrupt literature, modernism sort of disrupts literature and and, and turns upon itself and it, it tries to recognize that the world is not as ordered and simple uh, and as uh, logical as we might uh, assume it to be. And in some way, Freud does the same thing with the human being. And, and you know, Darwin does this in terms of our approach to religion and our approach to the natural world of which we're a part of that, that ecology. So putting the three of them together, you, you know, you, you have this uh, new approach to human life, this complexity that we begin to see, which is not, you know, it gets more complex every day. So I'm not a follower of Freud, but, but I, you know, I'm deeply interested in those processes. And they have an unusual capacity to reach for the moment that you're in and to, and to find a way of grasping what's taking place in the moment. And that's why they were very useful working with very troubled and disturbed children who were acting so chaotically because I didn't find much else that was that was actually helping me beyond literature to really understand and be able to find a, a language to engage them with. I, I'm not saying I use a language of psychoanalysis, but to use the, the notion that their behavior had meaning and could be thought about. And actually they responded remarkably well to that. So so Freud gave a lot of of those uh, those um uh, uh, attributes so that people can use in their daily life, in their working life, with very, very troubled and uh, and uh, vulnerable individuals. But equally, you know, I find Jung uh, fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the 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 notion of archetypes, which is you know bitten into the human psyche and is uh, clear from literature across the world. Um, the self-regulating psyche is a is a is a, a, a brilliant idea and again I would use that I would be thinking about that idea working with troubled uh, young people and in fact they're looking for a psychological e equilibrium and even the most violent and testing and difficult behavior uh, irrational behavior which is incredibly challenging for those people that are trying to work with it is a form of regulation of, of the self uh, if you can see it as such and you realize that even violent behavior is an attempt to do good but it's a very misguided attempt. Um, and so you can think very differently about, about those problems um, yeah. using uh, psycho, psycho, uh, psychoanalyst's work. But there are many, Melanie Klein, who, you know, who, who developed child, child analysis uh, and developed Freud's notions about uh, ambivalence in, in a very powerful way. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, you can critique psychoanalysts I mean, people like Winnicott I think are, are marvelous because he's he's even more engaged with uh, social work and uh, as a pediatrician was more engaged and had a greater capacity to talk to, to different kinds of workers across different fields mm -hmm. but you know psychoanalysis can be critiqued sometimes people say it doesn't take into consideration the social determinants that people uh, are faced with um, for my part I think it, it, it can and, and, and does because these things are all a part of both the conscious and the unconscious world. Um, but, you know, you were asking a bit before, I think you sort of hesitated in the question, but you were asking a bit before about uh, what Freud got yeah. right and wrong. Maybe you might say what psychoanalysis gets right and wrong. And um, you might say that, I mean, for me, Freud's dream theory is, is, is too mechanistic. You know, he builds, he's got a brilliant initial idea about the underlying meaning of dreams which, you know, even if somebody conclusively proved that they had no 
bearing on on the human psyche we would cons- con- you know we, we couldn't not analyze our own dreams because mm-hmm. it's it's in the nature of man to do so but um but uh you know he he he, o- he over mechanizes in my view that particular theory um but he gets a lot right and, and again mark soames has been doing some work to to bring freud's dream theory up to date and has a degree of you know, he validates a lot of what Freud has to say about dream theory from a neurological point of view, and he can show that for experimentation. Um, so he's a he's an interesting person, maybe worth interviewing if you can, if you can get him. Um, and Freud obviously uh, begins with studies in hysteria, looking at uh, seduction theory and the idea that a lot of the um, both psychological and uh, physical difficulties that people were bringing to his mm-hmm. clinic and it might be paralysis and and uh, fits and um, and all kinds of different uh, inhibitions and difficulties were related to seduction what he would call seduction we might call sexual abuse mm-hmm. and Freud was uh, in his early uh, career uh, impressed by the uh, you know the way in which there was a prolification he saw it everywhere really that, that there was sexual abuse taking place and um, for many years, you know, this was critiqued and it was seen as, as, a, as a, you know, too, too, um, too extreme a view. And Freud was, was criticised heavily by, by uh, colleagues in, and made it very difficult for him to get his career going in the early stages. And yet we have seen um, through different writers and authors investigating this and in our own recent experience uh, of sexual abuse, that actually it is. Uh, you know, very underreported. Um, sexual abuse seems to be everywhere. And at the moment, uh, over the last 10, 15 years, assaults on young people of uh, sexual assaults, by the way, have, have, have increased. And of course, now we have the internet and the, the particular uh, abuses of sexual kind on the internet are, are pr- proliferated enormously so that there are whole units in the, in the police force that are set up to deal with them and they can't. And you can read a lot of the literature here. So th- there's something quite interesting there, because Freud abandons the seduction theory in terms of a much more symbolic view. And that's where he begins to almost retreat from this sort of idea that this, these things happen to the notion that they're unconscious fantasies. And that the benefit of that is it takes us into the inner world. It takes us into the inner world, uh, the notion of fantasy, that our own think- thoughts and feelings can have um, uh, an effect upon us in, in a very profound way and that is right he didn't entirely abandon seduction theory of course he, he never abandoned it fully he recognized that it can continue to, to take place but I'm, I'm very interested in the fact that I think initially he was right that, that sexual abuse affects many many more people than we know and explains or not explains but certainly contributes to a lot of the uh, mental ill health and some of the diagnoses that people might have might relate to schizophrenia, for example. Certainly the young people that I work with, I was fully aware, had been sexually and physically abused and neglected, sometimes all of these, over many, many years. Um, but this wasn't talked about by the practitioners working with them. And often even psychiatrists and psychologists and clinical psychologists who work with the children were not engaging in thinking about the impact of these, these uh, behaviours. Because, of course sexual abuse is extraordinarily difficult to contemplate and to talk about and we might be forgiven for finding it very difficult to engage with it Um, and therefore there can be a a denial and a sort of petition brought up which reflects the nature of sexual abuse because it's based upon this notion of denial that's the whole point is that a person can be abused to the side in society or in a family and the people in the family may deny it is taking place so um, you know, that's a, a very fascinating area, but Freud was both right and wrong about it. Um, people like Jeffrey Mason, who've written books uh, about, about Freud and, you know, having a look at the Freud archive, who are uh, scathingly critical, as though Freud was sort of, you know, uh, willing this sort of you know, absolute denial on the basis of a desire to develop his theory. But I think Mason goes far too far uh, in, in that attack. And uh, it seems to me that um, it was important, actually, to develop this notion of unconscious fantasy, which has given so much to other areas of, of uh, psychoanalysis and psychotherapy and, and indeed psychology. And I know many, I know many uh, clinical psychologists myself who, who utilise a psychodynamic approach and find that it enriches 
um, their more scientific uh, and uh, experimental methodology um, and uh, help them you know with the sort of deeper meaning of some of the some of the difficulties their clients faces so I think bringing these things together is is is, is pretty useful Freud was rather dogmatic at times you know that's, that's certainly the case and and he uh, he was obviously at the beginning of a, a, a developing a particular idea perhaps he tended to be exaggerative in his claims the idea that you know that, 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 that people could be cured of particular difficulties and found that of course people returned with the same symptoms years later and this has been the the case it will continue to be the case mm. um so you know there has to be a, a bit of a retreat from some of the the early claims for psychoanalysis but it is a very humane treatment mm -hmm. and in fact what people are being offered quite often today which is short-term therapy mm -hmm. um in a quite a mechanistic way uh even the kind of children that i described to you who have severe difficulties and are unlikely to be able to live uh, in a society very, very, very easily without long-term treatment, might be offered these days six sessions of CBT, mm -hmm. um, which and you know and be asked to go and do homework on some of their difficulties. And of course, they have difficulties of neglect and ill treatment from birth until the age of 15 or 16. Mm -hmm. Six weeks of CBT or any kind of mechanistic treatment mm -hmm. uh, may not be overly helpful there are some young people by the way who who cannot access their their uh, internal world very very readily in my experience and um and certainly do not want to go through any kind of treatment that would that would mean that they have to be more aware of what have, what has happened to them until they have developed sufficient what we might call ego strength but you might say uh, confidence in themselves self-esteem and later on maybe in their 30s or even 40s they may be able to go back to therapy and, and unearth that so so cbt and, and more lighter treatments can can be very effective for those people but for many they may come out of residential care and other and other experiences no, never having the opportunity to have properly engage with um, the very causes and reasons that they came into those settings in the first place, mm. which, which, you know, which, which is odd, really, given that those settings are designed to meet their needs uh, in relation to their, um, their difficulties in mistreatment. So it's quite a complicated I, I, uh, area here. But I think Freud was, was right about many things, um, but uh, you know, over uh, made some claims that were rather too large, mm. and, um, <clears throat> and perhaps... Um, it should not have retreated so far from seduction theory or should have incorporated it more into the later developments of psychoanalysis. You can say a lot about the Oedipus complex as, as a sort of idea, but again, I have to say I engage with this as, a, as an element of sort of humanities. It's a pattern in life. It's a way of thinking about the difficulties and dynamics of family life, the rivalries and com competitiveness in family life between children and uh, and their parents and between children and siblings uh, in, in fact and in th the Oedipus complex can also be looked at in relation to organizational life and group life very fruitfully but it doesn't have to be something which is there always in all people and in all situations it is one of the possibilities one of the shapes in which human difficulties can be expressed and thought about Mm -hmm. And um, uh, th 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 those things that you've mentioned, um, I is there one thing that you um, believe to be scientifically true about psychoanalysis but has not been widely acknowledged so far? Um, you mentioned about Oedipus complex. Is, is, is that one of those? <laughs> Certainly not. Not the Oedipus complex. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I think the Oedipus complex gives an enormous amount mm -hmm. and it's been taken up by psychoanalysts who've written extraordinarily brilliant works on it. And it's been taken up in a number of other ways. You know, sociologists are very interested in it. It's, it's got a lot to, you know, to, to give to human society. And the fact for me that it, it's drawn from ancient Greek literature suggests that there's something here of a pattern which is fundamental. And it has something to say about our development through life, not just the sort of taboos about incest, but also, you know, the first thing that happens to poor Oedipus is somebody puts a spike for his leg and ties him to a rock and leaves him abandoned. And so the attack is upon the child. And, you know, so you want to see that the rivalry between the child and the adult uh, is, is a, a key factor 
in this particular myth. And so it has, it can go in many different directions and I don't think it should be discounted simply because it isn't scientifically true of each child in a very formulaic way. That's not the issue. But, but one of the areas I'm interested in, in, in psychoanalysis is hysteria. And Freud uh, moves into psychoanalysis and begins to develop a number of his theories through the study of hysteria. And hysteria is complicated. Um, you know, uh, it can be looked at in terms of, uh, you know, um, uh, feminist perspectives, a particular way of viewing uh, women in, in general, and um, in a very negative and diminishing way. And there's some validity in that, that view, apart from the fact that Freud recognised that hysteria affects men as well. And of course, you're drawing upon, again, ancient Greece for the idea of hysteria, the wandering womb, the idea that there's some sort of animal within that might be wandering through the body. And it comes up through different periods in, in history, this idea of hysteria. There was a guy called um, Glover who, you know, during the sort of witch trials in the 1600s, you know, was defending um, uh, somebody who was accused of witchcraft by saying that um, the, the mind can, in fact, cause physical ailments in the body. And uh, he defended a lady for, of witchcraft. Unfortunately, he lost in the in the law court. Um, she was she was uh, I think she was hung. But he was saying that um, the person that who she had afflicted was afflicted by their own fright. They were frightened of her, and this fright caused um, paralysis. It caused fits, all kinds of other difficulties that this young lady um, experienced. Um, so you know, hysteria comes up in a number of ways uh, through time. But Freud takes it up at Sulpetria when he recognises that the kind of demonstrations that Charcot was engaging in, showing that the particular symptoms of paralysis in the right arm could also be moved to the left through hypnosis. And there were these rather inhumane demonstrations with many people coming to watch these demonstrations. And Charcot was a sort of great god of you know, this particular approach. But Freud and Bura. Um, were, saw the therapeutic benefit of, of hypnosis and began to explore uh, what was really going on and writes quite brilliantly actually about medical treatment. You know, he was a, aware, for example, that if you have a neurological disorder, then that, that neurological difficulty has a pattern. So, you know, if you can't move your right hand, you'll not be able to move it in a particular way if a certain neurological uh, difficulty or lesion or whatever it might be is, is evident then that's stable. The symptom can't move anywhere or be different in any particular way. So you can't fake hysteria. You can't fake a paralysis. If you have a, an epileptic fit, you think is genuine, but it isn't a genuine fit because there's no neuro neurological difficulty. Of course, now we can test through scans. Um, uh, it doesn't mean to say that you don't feel genuinely afflicted by it. And in fact, it is an illness. Mm -hmm. So Freud introduces the idea that that the, you know, the unconscious mind to some extent is afflicting the individual and that might be rooted in experiences. They weren't all to do with sexual abuse actually, but he does, that is one of the overriding um, uh, causes in, in, in his uh, case histories, which you can read in, in studies and, and in others of, uh, other of his early papers. You know, he writes in quite, quite fairly detailed case studies about hysteria. Mm -hmm. Um, and, you know, this idea has been discounted. People say that hysteria doesn't exist. It was stricken, taken out of the, uh, the um, diagnostic uh, manuals. Um, uh, so they, they became much more psychiatric in their diagnosis. Psychoanalysis, which was heavily engaged in the, in the early diagnostic manual, was, was extracted. And you have functional neurosis, which sort of exists. Um, some people call it conversion, you know, and this idea of conversion was in fact a, a, a term coined by Freud and Bure in, in studies in hysteria. So the idea that a physical symptom, uh, you know, a, a, sorry, a psychological difficulty is converted into a physical symptom begins in studies in hysteria and it exists still today in the diagnostic manual. But people with these kinds of difficulties tend not to go to psychiatrists they do go to neurologists and there's a neurologist um, who wrote a book called All in the Head in the, in the last, I think it was about four years ago, um, uh, Sue Sullivan. Um, and she, as a neurologist, describes many patients coming to her uh, with neurological difficulties. And, uh, you know, they may, they, I mean, one person came but couldn't see and I really believe she couldn't see. 
another another person came with fits another person had a paralysis and couldn't couldn't move couldn't stand up all kinds of she gives a number of quite detailed case studies and she tries to explain these issues because she does all the psychological all of the um, scientific neurological testing in 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 the clinic and and finds that there are not neurological difficulties a person who's presenting with epilepsy does not have epilepsy uh, so what are they presenting with and how come they don't know they're presenting with this you know why is it that they're not aware that, that, that something is is is, is odd uh, going on here and she draws upon the, the theories of freud and Bura to account for these neurological symptoms she says freud and Bura got a number of things wrong but we don't have a better explanation freud and, and brewer Bura are arguing that you know that people that have particular uh, shocks um, adversity of a, of a quite specific kinds in their early years were likely to experience these hysterical symptoms and this is exactly what Sullivan is saying today there are other people there's a guy called Tim Nicholson who's no relation of mine but he <laughs> he he looks into this he, he looks at the background of people suffering from conversion disorder or uh, functional uh, neurosis where there is uh, in apparent physical difficulty but no neurological symptoms. And he's looked into the background uh, of those people in a much more methodological way, um, looking with, you know, with control groups, looking at the number of adverse experiences they, they've uh, encountered, and does indeed find that they have a, a higher frequency and a greater intensity of adverse experiences, some of which would be very similar to the kind of issues that Freud was describing. So I'm very interested in this idea from uh, 1885, 1886, uh, that Freud has about hysteria, which is still current today, um, being seen in neurology, but is entirely denied in the psychiatric uh, frame and not really sort of considered, you know, considered to be a sort of very outlandish and, and uh, old hat idea. But in fact, people are still presenting with the same disorder. Um, and Sue Sullivan's approach is to try to engage. She, she's not a psychoanalyst, so she can't engage psychoanalysis, but she engages with her patients exploratively and tries to get them to, to recognize that perhaps there might be particular pressures upon them or perhaps, perhaps there are particular experiences they've undergone that have led to them wanting to kind of um, retreat from elements of their life and hence these physical symptoms come, come about. And to some extent she's been successful, but she finds the difficulty for patients is to is this notion that there is something that's wrong with them of a medical kind, not a psychological kind, making that transition to recognize that they may be contributing to their own disorder is extraordinarily painful. Mm. Um, and she, she goes very sensitively. But for those that could recognize this, you know, they do begin to make some headway mm. and do recover. So that's, that's fascinating that neurologists today are dealing with the same issues that Freud was dealing with all those years ago and still find his, his particular theoretical model uh, useful in that procedure. Uh, and that is very little known, I think, but, but it's something to be celebrated and, and investigated. And that's something you know, I'd like to, to write a bit more about. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Dr. Nicholson, so, some people, because I, what, what I do is um, I, I run a website um, and then I publish, sometimes I publish mental health stories and there seem to be um, a recurring theme that, you know, s some people feel that seeking therapy is a defeat and they often ask themselves, um, why can I do it on my own? So what do you make of that? Well, that's a fascinating um, subject. I mean, I said to you before, you know, I was influenced by Anthony Storr's work. The, the principal book that he wrote was a book called Solitude, beautiful book, um, looking at the poets and writers and philosophers who lived a solitary life. And in fact, so he was, he was arguing in that book that you can do it on your own mm -hmm. in some ways. Of course, we're not all Keats. We're not all Immanuel Kant. Uh, we, we, you know, we're, we're not all Beethoven. And we're not all able to do it all on our own so easily. These people, you may say, had suffered a good deal of adversity, which took them away from social relationships. In fact, they felt unable to engage in intimate relationships in a particular way. And that's part of the difficulty for them. So their only recourse was toward their art form, and that was their form of engagement. Well, we're not all like that, you know. Mm -hmm. So I do believe that creativity... Um, self-reflection, introspection, and after all, Freud and Jung and other writers and other psychoanalysts have engaged in periods of introspection on their own. 
and some of their theories develop exactly through that process. So I believe that's absolutely the case, that people can do that and should do that. Mm -hmm. And if they read literature and explore and paint and draw, one of the outcrops of psychoanalysis is, is are the art therapies, mm -hmm. uh, art, art, art psychotherapy, uh, drama, drama therapy, psychodrama. These are all different ways to explore the inner world and explore our own history and uh, to use our objects as a sort of self-referent, you know? Children in the uh, children's homes, by the way, would engage in art therapy quite a lot. And, and, you know, I remember one child who suffered with epilepsy and was an extraordinarily violent uh, young man went into his first art therapy session mm -hmm. and emerged proudly with this little piece of clay that he had designed, and it was a volcano spewing out lava. This was in the first week of his arrival. He'd been a kitten. I mean, he'd been a lovely little child, model young person coming into the community. Um, warm, everybody loved him. We were warm to him. But this little volcano that he brought out uh, was a, a sort of presage to what was to come when his anger exploded and his epileptic fits, which seemed very genuine, uh, were one explosion. But there were moments of extraordinary anger breaking windows attacking members of staff verbal abuse a violent torrent you see and all of this was unconsciously expressed in his volcano and gave us an indication about what was going to happen so i really do believe that you know artwork engaging in art uh, engaging in writing writing a diary writing a memoir you know writing these kinds of things self-referentially self-reflectively is terribly important and is enormously valuable um you know what one of the uh, the outcrops of another outcrop of sort of you know, psychoanalysis is is reflective writing mm -hmm. and it's used as a form of treatment you know um so these are marvelous um marvelous uh, opportunities but uh, you know study of literature of these things will, will teach you a lot about yourself so certainly you can do a lot on your own but it has been said that uh, a huge, in fact, I'm, I'll say it in the way it was originally said. They, uh, some, I can't remember really who said this. I think it, uh, I can't quite remember. But anyway, a man is only half a man. The second half is communication. Mm -hmm. The need to communicate, in, and I'm thinking man here is everyone, everybody. Mm -hmm. The need to communicate is a part of what we are. We are built to communicate. We are built to tell stories about ourselves. Mm -hmm. And you might say that psychoanalysis is a form of storytelling. Mm -hmm. um, we don't know about the objective truth about ourselves, but we, we, we have a story. That story may be quite deterministic. We might be stuck in a particular script. Psychoanalysis can help free up that script to some extent. Mm -hmm. I have colleagues that wouldn't agree with that view. They would, they would not like the idea that psychoanalysis was storytelling. But I, I believe that's, that's one of the ways in which we can think about it. Mm -hmm. We have to tell that story to someone, and that's part of Freud's innovation, you know, that he gave his patients time and he paid attention to them. Mm -hmm. He gave them recognition and validation. He told them they could say anything. He would not censor them. The normal social, you know, I mean, there are certain things you don't say to your family, aren't there, about yourself and about your own attitudes and your own thoughts, what, 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 what you're going through. You don't tell even perhaps your best friend because certain social conditions put a pressure in a certain culture on, on discussing certain issues and areas. And even some of the things we've discussed are quite difficult for some people to, to think about, you know, today. And Freud releases this with this idea of free association. This is a huge uh, freedom, you know, to, to, to allow us to be freed from the chains in which we put ourselves. I must not talk about that. And, and that actually might be part of my problem, that I cannot talk about a particular issue, you know. And, and those issues there may go into a phobia, an obsession with something trivial, because I'm moving the obsession from something I, I need to speak about but can't into some other area, you see. So, so having someone to talk to, to respond to, to validate one's experience, to be a witness to one's difficulties is absolutely fundamental. And therefore, a, a dynamic interaction is often necessary. Not for everyone, but for many people. And I would have to say that one of the greatest ideas, not only in psychoanalysis, but in the history of human ideas, in my view, is the idea of transference. And that notion that in psychoanalysis, 
which obviously Freud objected against the transference initially and found it objectionable and difficult and an interruption, but gradually began to realize this was an aid. In the interaction between the analyst and the, and the patient, something gets recreated of the patient's difficulties in the interaction. Mm -hmm. The patient begins to project upon to the analyst some of their internal relational difficulties, mm -hmm. whatever that might be with. So they might feel that the analyst is always critiquing them, you know, always being critical or doesn't pay enough attention to them or isn't interested in, or is bored with them, you know. And they don't talk about this and complain about it, but they show it in the way they treat the analyst. Uh, Freud would talk about this sort of plastic uh, um, uh, description. You know, it comes out as, as a sort of form of acting in the therapeutic setting, this transference. And that idea that we bring our relational history with us and re-engage in it, almost reenact it in, in later interactions is key. And it's, it's not only useful in psychoanalysis, it's useful everywhere because we're all doing it all the time. Um, and it's a very, very powerful idea. And, uh, and I think it, it says something about the need for a relationship because the other person listening, particularly if the psychoanalyst doesn't know you, they've, they've come to this interaction you know, fresh, they're not a member of your family or your friendship group, they don't, they're not polite, they don't need to worry about offending you you know, because people won't tell you things that they notice about you, is there, you know, that would jeopardize your relationship. So the psychoanalyst or another therapist coming from an objective position can help the patient to think about, or the client, to think about what it is they're bringing and gradually make an interpretation. And I don't mean, a, you know, an on high worldly interpretation, a very sensitively given observation about what might be taking place that can be terribly powerful and meaningful for the, for the uh, client. And, and, and I have to say, I think transference is not just in psychoanalysis everywhere. You'll find it in literature uh, in all kinds of ways. And for me, the best example of transference is given in the Iliad, uh, in the last part of the Iliad, where Achilles goes uh, uh, to King Priam, uh, Priam to ask for uh, the body of Patroclus back. And, um, and uh, you know, uh, sorry, when, when Priam goes to Achilles to ask for the body of Patroclus back. And, and the, the key thing here is he doesn't go as the king of the Trojans. He goes just as a man dressed in ordinary robes. Um, he's aided to get there by, by a god, but he gets there and he begins to talk to Achilles. And Achilles is grief stricken and incredibly angry. And the whole book of the Iliad is about Achilles' anger. That's what it's about. And he could kill Priam uh, easily um, with a flick of a finger. You know, he's, a, he's like a god man. But Priam goes as an old man. And what happens here is Achilles, all of his defenses, all of his martial law, all of his desire to be a great hero and a great warrior, uh, which, he, which he becomes through the process of the war, um, are, are broken through. Because what he sees in Priam is an image of his own father, who he knows he'll never see again. Mm -hmm. and, and he strokes Priam's beard. You know, he takes hold of this wonderful moment of contact. You know, the god Achilles, this brutal monster of a man, takes hold of this man's beard and, and sort of strokes it. And he's thinking of his father, you see. So that's an image of transference right there. Very powerful, bitten into the earliest and greatest work of literature um, that human beings have to draw upon. And Freud isolates this dynamic through the experience of clinical engagement. It emerges not as something preconceived in his mind, not as a theory, but learning it from the interactions that his clients brought to him in the moment and begins to see the value of that particular mechanism. It's that relationality which I think is crucial to talking therapies. Mm -hmm. Now, um, I, I could clearly um, hear your passion about um, psychoana psychoanalysis, about um, storytelling and about self-awareness. But um, Dr. Nicholson, outside of your work, um, what are your other um, interests? Yeah, OK. Well, I mean, there are, there are other interests. I, mean, I, I mentioned Robert Graves for a start. Uh, Robert Graves, the English poet. And, and that's where I started my PhD. And that work, um, that what I was writing about, was um, 
Graves' poetry um, <clears throat> uh, and his uh, writings. How were his writings affected by his experiences in the First World War? Robert, Robert Graves was a very intellectual, brilliant kind of academic, quite a traditionist in many respects. And yet he went on in the 1940s to write this very, very crazy book called The White Goddess, which was um, uh, 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 a sort of, you know, cross-disciplinary piece of writing um, about poetry, about history, about mythology. Um, clearly, though, it was also about the First World War. Um, uh, the word First World War was not really mentioned, but it was about the First World War. Um, and uh, it, 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 for me, there was something about looking at Graves' history, his background, his childhood, and his poetry, and looking at those early influences on his life, which were really to do with his wounding in, in the First World War. He was shot right through the chest, um, uh, right through the upper body at Mammoth's Wood, and left for dead. And this uh, extraordinary experience left him with a feeling that he had actually died and been resurrected. And you can see this is related to, you know, Fraser and the Golden Bow and the whole Christian tradition. Uh, but he abandons Christianity, uh, which he thinks has let everybody down in a way. You know, it hasn't protected us from the horrors of the First World War. And, um, and he begins to develop this, this notion about poetry, inspiration and, and revivification. Uh, the idea that we have to face ourselves, our own difficulties, and in some sense we do die, and, and we may, may be resurrected in some particular way. And he does this for a particular mythology, which is expressed in the White Goddess, which is, you know, you can talk about myths, but the idea this is a sort of modern myth, but the White Goddess is really nature. He's talking about the brutal truths of nature. And we're facing them now with the coronavirus. We're all at threat of death, and we have to take that consideration into our lives and not deny it and not be not aware of it. So my engagement with Grace was to really take a new critical reading of his work. Uh, many people had looked at his poetry in a rather derogatory way. I and mean, he's got many, many champions, lots of uh, works about his poetry, but he had been seen as minor poetry and that he was a sort of traditionalist. And I saw him as a modernist writer, a great modernist writer, and tried to indicate in a number of ways why his writing was a bit more complex than people gave it credit for. I have to say he was influenced in his uh, early writings by a character called Rivers, who he met at a military war hospital. And Rivers was, um, was uh, an anthropologist and, uh, and uh, um, you know, um, uh, a psychologist who was uh, interested in neurology and was uh, reading Freud. And therefore, poor old Robert Graves was influenced by Freud, even in the 1920s, uh, by Rivers and psychoanalysis sort of got into the way that he thought about the world. So there was a sort of link there, but I didn't discover that to many years later. So writing about Graves is still something I'm doing. Uh, one of the last things I wrote was about Robert Graves, um, uh, uh, Hemingway, and uh, a guy called Wilfred Bion, who's a psychoanalyst, but it was also a tank commander in the First World War. And there I was drawing upon Freud in a way, because I was looking at the repetition compulsion how Graves in his life and Hemingway in his life, this is biographical, repeated some of the wounding experiences that they'd suffered in the First World War, actually repeated those, those woundings, put themselves in positions where they were at risk of injury. And many of those injuries were remarkably close to the actual woundings and, uh, that they suffered in the First World War. And, and looking at that in, in their lives, um, but also why Hemingway became very depressed and despondent and eventually committed suicide. Graves was unwell all his life, but was an incredibly productive writer of over a thousand poems, about 40, 40 other works, including uh, novels and uh, literary works. And Wilfred Bion became a great psychoanalyst, fascinated by group dynamics. He wrote brilliant work on, on group dynamics mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and many works about psychotherapy. Um, <clears throat> what was it that enabled Graves and, and Beyond to do so well in their later lives? And what was the nature of the repetition for them? Uh, but what about what was going wrong for Hemingway the, the, as a great literary writer that he wasn't able to, to, uh, to utilise his literature in, in the same way, but actually physically enacted 
in a much more prolific way those those injuries and those wounds so that was quite an interesting study and i'd like to follow that up a bit a bit more um some of the early things i wrote about were about children self-harming and I, I described a little bit about that but that's because that was what was afflicting me at the time and i was dealing with children self-harming and i had to write about it because i had to understand what was taking place I've written about um, uh, looked after children and the difficulties they have making the transition from care to what gets called independence. Um, when I hope to God they don't have to be fully independent because none of us really are. We're all interdependent, aren't we? And mm -hmm. codependent upon each other. These children are said to have to go from dependence to independence, which is quite a harsh journey. And there are particular difficulties in that, in that journey particularly because during the period of transition, the loss of losing their key workers and their, the people that have been caring for them and working with them for many years, are very, very painful. And these painful experiences bring up the early losses uh, from their childhood, losses of their primary objects, their parents and others, even though these people perhaps not always treated them well. But these losses are brought up. And that means just at the point where they're making a transition to into adulthood, they actually become more unstable. And it's interesting that I know that you're interested in narrative uh, and, 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 and story. And, and these young people are looking for a cohesive story. But at the very time they're looking for that cohesive story to launch themselves into adulthood with, their story becomes more complex because of their insight and memory into their early life. So they need a particular kind of very contained, thoughtful uh, support from social workers and residential care workers to get them through that, that transition. What happens is a lot of people think, when we get well, we get well like we're going up an escalator. Very steadily, we're getting better and better and better, and eventually, all the supports can be taken away because we're fine, we're, we're doing well. But we know, you and I know, that it's not like that, is it? People regress, they go backwards and forwards, and in fact, sometimes, the point at which you're going to remove supports uh, is the very point that people regress and that is because unconsciously they're aware that they 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 they, they, they will lose those supports they 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 depend upon them and they're anxious about the capacity to move forward without them and and we have to make them aware of that because actually quite often they can cope and it's and again it's the inner mind the inner world you might say the unconscious and the unconscious anxiety about their own capacities that are holding them back. In other words, it's a form of self-sabotage. It's mm -hmm. a form of self-sabotage. Um, and so writing about that was something I found engaging and also important, because I think it's really rather complex. And um, social workers and residential workers are incredibly pressured in their work. They always have more cases than they can manage, and they need all the support they can get to help them really think about the complexity of what seem like ordinary transitions, but are actually very, very difficult and very complex. Now, um, Dr. Nicholson, well, um, I always ask this question to, to my guests, because um, this is a show about psychology and mental health. Um, for you, what's one thing about mental health and psychology that you think we should be talking more about? Well, uh, I mean, there are lots of things. So you ask about, you know, what the one thing is, but I, I think it's enormously difficult to pinpoint one thing. I, I've been very interested in recent years about the issue of suicide. Mm -hmm. A number of years ago, one of uh, um, the PhDs that I examined was on, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, this is from a Jungian point of view, it's looking at Jungian theory and suicide, and the individual um, student had an idea about what she called a sort of suicide complex, mm -hmm. and this was a complex, an internal complex that happened if a person had been bereaved, um, and if you've been bereaved by somebody that's committed suicide specifically, this created a very... Uh, complicated bereavement process. The, the dynamics of that bereavement were, were rather different because this was a bereavement by a suicide. And the meaning of suicide is, is very complex. It may, you may even feel that it was an attack upon you. The suicide was, a, was an act of aggression, um, sort of retroactive, you know, it's coming back toward you. And that was very difficult. And I found myself fascinated by that PhD student's work, very interesting work uh, in itself. But we've seen, you know, over the, over recent years uh, in, in, in higher education, not necessarily suicide rate going up because it usually is around the same rate 
as the society in which the university sits. But we have recognised and paid more attention to the issue of suicide and mental health in higher education. And I'm really interested in exploring that more. Um, suicide in itself is, is, is fascinating. Of course, it kills uh, young men, uh, particularly. Men, men are particularly afflicted by suicide. It's one of the highest um, killers, you know, above things like heart disease, which used to be the overriding killer of, uh, of men. And, 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 and I wonder what it is about the male psyche, about the male personality mm. that, that means that they're more liable to suicide. What is it that's taking place here? Mm -hmm. That's a fascinating topic in itself. But how we understand the, the difficulties of mental health in higher education, what kind of communities, what kind of social entities are higher education establishments? What particular pressures do they generate? not only on students, PhD students, undergraduate students, but also actually on academics, mm -hmm. on academics who also, you know, suffer enormously with mental health difficulties. Um, and, and what are the particular pressures in those environments? And again, I think this is some, something that psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic ideas have something to say about because they, we do think about, and I teach modules on organisation dynamics, uh, and I think there's a lot to be said here. But it's very important, actually, that these are investigated um, in a naturalistic way, perhaps even, as these particular social enterprises. Not just thinking about suicide is the same everywhere. It might be suicide and mental health may be very difficult, different in particular contexts. You know, in residential settings, there is an environment and a culture which is specific. In uh, higher education establishments, the culture is specific. In schools, the culture is very specific. They have different conditions. They have different unspoken attitudes to the children for example or to the adults in higher education there are very different kinds of political and social processes at, at work so to try to track these and to understand what it is they may be contributing to individuals and we're all vulnerable to mental health difficulties in fact we're all likely to suffer mm -hmm. mental health difficulties at one point or other in our lives this is quite normal and i and i see it as a part of what makes life in, in, enriching you know, we're, we're not simply OK and go through life happy and content. And we have to accept that life is difficult at times. It can be joyous and fun and amazing and wonderful and rapturous, but it can be difficult at times. And this is a part of the depth of human life. It's not to be denied, but to be embraced. So there's nothing wrong in any sense with having mental health difficulties. We ought to accept it and think about it and work with it, not rather against it in that sense. Mm -hmm. But we can investigate in specific cultures a bit more about what the particular characteristics might be contributing to these difficulties. Mm -hmm. That um, certainly talking about suicide and the pressure of um, higher education in relation to mental health is really something that we should be talking about, as you've pointed out. Now, Dr. Nicholson, as my final question, um, what's in the pipeline? Do you have any upcoming book or because we're in the middle of the lockdown, um, do you deliver a webinar or any of that sort? Yeah, well, I do. I'm delivering one this afternoon, which is mm. going to be on uh, Jekyll and Hyde. Mm. Uh, and uh, I don't know who's going to be in the audience, but they're, they're students that are interested in coming to University of Essex. Um, so I, I guess, you know, there's, there's, uh, there, are, there are webinars of that kind. But we, we're teaching online, as you know, and I know some of your guests have been talking about this. And um, it's very interesting to be doing that teaching in a different way. As you'll understand it, uh, you know, talking about psychosocial and psychic ideas, we often think of, you know, these therapeutic engagements as, as something you do face to face. It's very important that it's face to face. You're actually in physical contact. So the move to online teaching is, is helping us to learn more about the possibilities, what actually is coming through in the interaction. Um, what might be new in that interaction. So it's actually rather fascinating. This is a, a great experiment pushing us to learn more about these uh, these conditions that we're under. Uh, but we, we do do webinars and we will be doing more webinars and, and uh, uh, of ordinary teaching seminars. You know, I teach on trauma and I teach on violence, uh, reflective practice, these kinds of things. Mm -hmm. So and my colleagues are going to be doing lots of teaching across the board. Um, many of the colleagues in our department are also sociological in their thinking, not only psychoanalytic. So there's a sort of combination of those ideas in, the, in their teaching. Um, for me, in terms of what's in the pipeline, and I'm running the department, and, and that's quite a, a preoccupation at the moment because we're, 
we're having to change all of our procedures and practices at the moment and that's really interesting but you know we're doing other, other things we're running support groups a number of my colleagues are running support groups um, entirely free I, I might hasten to add as a part of the efforts to help people think about these this particular situation uh, running support groups for other therapists and practitioners who are working at the front line in these very difficult conditions and I think that those practitioners need not only the physical support of the uh, protective equipment that we're struggling to get but they also need psychological and emotional support do they not because you know contamination is not only a biological entity it's a psychological entity isn't it and the fear and the anxiety about their, their uh, difficulties and their work is going to have a large effect. And that effect won't just be now. We're, we're dealing with the immediate crisis. But for years after, we're going to be thinking about and looking at the psychological and emotional impact upon practitioners and upon all of us in many ways, but those at the front line in particular, who are facing death and dying daily, which in our society, in Western societies, you'll know, we don't do very well. Death is rather marginalized but now it's very much uh something we're having to deal with mm -hmm. so the after effects of this are going to be great and we should be doing all we can to offer support now to mm -hmm. enable let's say some of these problems and difficulties not to become unconscious not to become avoided and go underground but to allow us to really contemplate and think about these things uh so that there is a kind of emotional hygiene you know we, we are dealing with that contamination of a psychological kind and processing it and understanding it and I think if we don't do that um, the uh, mental health impact later on will be much greater so that's one of the things I'd like to be involved in and, mm. and our department I hope can be involved in we've got many people who can offer succor and support but also importantly understanding and research about about what's happening uh, just at the moment Mm -hmm. Well, um, Dr. Nicholson, um, it's been an insightful conversation with you. It's really, um, I would say this is really one of the longest um, interview um, that oh. I've carried out. But thank you for, for, for the wisdom, um, for, for sharing us your insights and expertise. And um, I look forward to hearing more about your work. Well, uh, it's been a great pleasure and a really interesting experience to do the interview. And, and thanks very much, Dennis, for allowing me to, to do it. Maybe we'll speak again at another point. Thank you.